sky upon the sea Green, the taste of dim Memories of a dream The burst of flaming roses Red, passionate and free Finding common ground, the warmth of morn, comfort and calm, gold a place where dreams are glowing, colors of the heart. Welcome to the Abstract Art Behind the Scenes premiere webinar. My name is Julie Cohn. I want to be more imaginative, to exercise my imaginative muscle. And I imagine that you're here today because you would like to do that or have an experience that expands you. The realistic painters, such as Leonardo da Vinci, and other painters like him, they were imaginative in certain ways, but in a different way from those who do abstract painting. So when you look at the Mona Lisa and you see in the background, there's a stream and a bridge and a beautiful pastoral setting. That would not have been a natural setting where she would have been posing. Maybe it was a possible place where she lived or, or a place that she loved. But Leonardo da Vinci was imaginative in the way he brought her together with that scene. The artist Salvador Dali, Spanish artist, he was very imaginative in a different way. He loved to put two things together that were realistic by themselves or an idea that was realistic like something dripping, a faucet dripping, and a clock that was on the wall. And he brought both of them together in one image, a dripping clock. It's a very imaginative way to work. Now, when we come to an abstract piece of art and we're looking at that, all abstract art is varied. I mean, some of it has some aspects of realism in it, some have very little realism or just representational things that are more like symbols. But abstraction, just by itself, what it does is it helps us to be more imaginative because the artist is more is very imaginative in terms of what he or she are putting on paper. So when we look at that abstract, we can come up with so many different ideas of what the artist was doing or what we feel. And I, I really love looking at abstract art because we all interpret it our own way and we really feed each other with wonderful ideas as we look at the work. Paul Clay was an incredible abstract artist. He didn't start that way though. He actually was born into a family of musicians. He was born in 1879 and his mom and dad were Swiss and German, respectively. They were both music teachers, and they helped Paul to have a lot of rhythm in his life. He basically played violin, just like not a concert violinist, but he was incredibly good even at the age of 11. And his parents had him on a track of music, that that's what he would do the rest of his life. And at 19, he said to his parents, you know, I really don't want to disappoint you, but would it be okay if I go to the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich? And they were a little bit disappointed. They didn't really want to honor that, but they said, we want our son to be happy. So he went there and he learned so much about color, line, all kinds of elements of design and the principles of design. And while he was there, he met some amazing people. Two of them were incredible artists that we all probably have heard of. Vasily Kandinsky 
and Franz Mark. Okay? And together, along with other artists, eventually they created a group called Der Blau Reiter, which means the Blue Equestrian. That in itself is a very imaginative name. And as they were together, they started getting all excited about different ways of approaching the painting uh, abstractly and also using color less realistically. Now, that's not to mention, I mean, not to say that they were not also very, very influenced by the Cubists, by the German Expressionists around, okay, by um, Surrealism. I mean, they were, they were definitely taking in Impressionism, you know, so all of these things were really influencing their use of color and design. So what we're going to do together is talk about paintings. And before we do that, I have a couple of things to show you to talk about how we can have our discussion really smoothly. <clears throat> First of all, I would love it. Whoever is interested in responding to my questions tonight, please do. And um, remember that sometimes there will be two of you responding at the same time because I will not be calling on you. I'll just ask who would like to respond. So please give way to a person if they seem to want to talk a little more than you. And if for some reason, if you really can't get a word in edgewise tonight, and you're frustrated, make sure you definitely get your feelings in the chat area. And then at least you can share how you're feeling about what you're seeing. Respect. I really know that I will try to respect all of your answers and, and your feelings about the art. And I'm asking you to also respect that we have a lot of people tonight who might want to talk. So I'd like you to keep your answers brief, meaning just a few sentences. Renew. I hope tonight you will feel renewed and refreshed and that it will help your imagination to really go new places. And last but not least, to relax, knowing that even if we all can't talk, we can learn so much by listening. And this will be a really fun experience all the way around if we can just settle into it. So without further ado, I'm showing you a photograph of Paul Clay. It's grainy, but I really like it. He's got this intensity about him. And actually most photographs of him are very intense. I just preferred this over the others. He definitely um, had a lot of fun working with etchings in the beginning of his art career. And this is a series which is called Inventions. Um, definitely a combination of surreal qualities, realistic qualities. And you can see that it's black and white or black and white and gray. Yeah. And he didn't feel very comfortable with color when he first started with art. This is called, um, let's see, we get this. Uh, Jungfrau in Baum, or Virgin in a Tree. So this here is a painting that he made in 1913 called In the Quarry. It's a watercolor. And he was really experimenting at that time with how to depict what was in front of him, but then to go inward and to get more reflective about it. So I'd like to ask you, in what way for you do you feel he's become more reflective, more imaginative within himself in this piece? Anybody can answer. Well, for one thing, he's got two moons up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he liked these circles. Anybody else? Uh, by the way, if you need to unmute to talk, you might have to press your space bar um, if, if you're trying to talk and I can't hear you. All right, so I'll ask another question. What is he doing here 
to symbolize aspects of nature. It's using a lot of um, a lot of shapes mm -hmm. and and color. So he got away from the black and white and gray, uh -huh. and he, he's you know he's using the color green to symbolize trees. It looks like, and he's using earth tones to symbolize the land, the land masses. Um, right. So color, color so is really color. Uh -huh. helping this too, right? Because the trees are mostly green, right? Right. And and shape wise, what's he doing to those shapes? That's imaginative, but still gives us this sense. That he's making them very triangular. A lot of triangles. Yes. Overlapping. Yeah, they're all the same mm -hmm. shape. Um, the other Overlapping thing, triangles, yeah. The other thing I'm seeing is, and I think it's by the way he's working with the shapes, I'm seeing him developing multiple uh, environments, like layers. It's almost like I, I feel myself going in and starting to tell a story. It feels like I can get lost in this, in these layers. Does that make sense? Very perceptive, yes. Because mm -hmm. he's got some solid layers and then he's got ones with more pattern. Yeah, yeah that's it. You know, and, and they go back and forth. He's mm -hmm. He's playing with these design ideas. And he's also using different sh shades of green, not just one color green. So, right. which is giving it, you know, darker greens, which is giving it a little more depth and, and dimension. It seems like he's also like allowing his emotions into it, mm -hmm. you know, um, sort of like w with a bright color, especially in the foreground, it, it feels to me kind of emotional, you know, and and uh, also like that really pointy hill kind of just <laughs> up to the right. And and yeah. then the, the trees, like the trees around that like pointy hill are not realistic because they're not connected. So in that sense, it's almost like he's he's painting like the gesture of the trees rather than like a realistic rendering of the trees. Almost looks like the tree behind is dancing or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about one more comment and then I'll move to the next one. It it reminds me of something like a child would almost approach it this way. And I wonder if he had a happy relationship with nature as a child. And it's something he carried with him. Um, and it, I want to tell you something about his relationship to children and their art. He really loved children's art and he put it on the level of fine artists who were adults, who were, who were known artists. Like he looked at children's art as much more, um, you know, mm -hmm. developed mm -hmm. and, and playful mm -hmm. in a way that shows the subconscious mm -hmm. um, coming through. Almost mm -hmm. like when a child is not told that they have to do art a certain way to be good. Mm -hmm. then that child comes through with a subconscious and there's so much beauty in that work. And he really took from that mm -hmm. more than many artists. He took the, he actually learned from children's art. So I'm going to move to the next one here. I see a lot of Dr. Seuss in his work. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. Now, now this one here is called in the style of Kerwan. It's a watercolor. It was made in 1914. He went to Tunisia in 1914. And when he got back, all he could feel was these colors and the light of Tunisia. And this abstract feeling in quality of the shapes came through in, in what would really be called an even more purely abstract painting than the one you just saw before. This is, I mean, you don't see really the trees define here and who knows if they are even trees and he said color has taken possession of me no longer do i have to chase after it i know it has a hold on me forever color and i are one i am a painter so i'd love to hear from anyone who wants to start the discussion how do we move through this painting and what grabs you The brightness, it's so bright. Yes. 
It, it looks like there's a figure on the left hand side in a doorway looking to the outside because what's behind him is a darker color. So it looks ah. like there's there's a, a, a room or a you know building behind him in the doorway. And I feel that it's looking outward to the colors to the right, which are brighter and more daylight. I oriented. love that. Oh, I see that too. Yeah, I didn't see that. Those shapes do look like a person in the doorway. Yeah, yeah, that's what I see too. The circle is, is the head of a person below. You could see the, the neck. And... I, I feel there's a, a kind of a cool colors on the right side and the warm color on the left side. Isn't that see. interesting? Yeah. Yes, and I'm drawn to the warm. Well, so. I want to ask you, how do you make a painting that's got cool on one side and warm on the other and still make it work together? Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like that, you know, you've got mostly warm on the left and cool on the right, but they've but he brought some of the warm over to the cool. So it was exactly. it, it allows it to be connected. Exactly. Right. And, and some of the cool over to the warm as well. It's also got a lot of rhythm in it for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot of rhythm and movement in this. It's like maybe he was in a city. I, I even thought of traffic lights. <laughs> but yeah. I just to say there, it's just great that so many different, there's so many different ways to interpret it. How about another one more I, thought? I, I would like to say, you know, as a quilter, what I see here is, I see a lot of variation in the width of his vertical bars mm -hmm. and the large bar, bar in the center of the picture. It's like an invitation in, and then you go into this world that's further away. Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel that diminution, which is getting smaller circles as we go farther back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're not as bright which is also in another way it's aerial like like or, or more subdued right yeah. to, to let them go in space yeah you know, it's kind of amazing how to me it this has a, a a lot of depth even though it sort of looks when you first look at it maybe it looks kind of flat but um you know because there are so many rectangles that are head on or circles that are head on but there are those uh, like diagonal lines just to this right of the center that create the sense of going back in space. And then you have these sort of layers on the right hand side that to me look like buildings, like going down a narrow alley, you know, and then mm -hmm. and then on the left, there is that feeling of being in a different, that warmer space, you know, and it, it does look sort of like a doorway and so it's it's that's like a different place so he's actually created a lot of structure even though it looks really abstract you've got it it's very fascinating to see how much we can actually relate this to see to a scene that where, where we could be present <laughs> that's that's really wonderful i'm gonna there's i to, to say one more thing because this is really sure critical sure. in terms of design um he's doing what we call jogging the line. And what does that mean? It means that he's breaking the line, the horizontal line, he's breaking it to, if it was straight across, you, you, would, you would get stuck. Ah, oh, nice. Jogging the line brings in movement. Oh. So it's just slightly shifting the line. Yeah. Dogging it is what they call it. Jogging. Oh. Jogging. jogging the line. Jogging. J-O-G-G-I-N-G. -G -G. Jogging. Oh, jogging. <laughs> yeah, they call it jogging the line. It's, it, it's not a dog. Confused. Okay, thank Don't you. Say, yeah, he's doing the, that. Jay gets lost a little there. Julie, can I ask huh? a question? It's Mary. Yeah. I haven't talked about art in such a long time. Sure. I'm looking, I'm trying to imagine if the part in the center of the three beautiful yellow circles weren't there. And it's like, this to me seems like the point that, that both unifies it and it's also the mm -hmm. transition. If I imagine it without that, that I can't make sense of the painting. It becomes very dull, very wow, wonderful. Wow, that is really astute because mm -hmm. the brighter color in the middle there is looking really luminous. And you can see the luminosity, like the glow mm -hmm. of that color throughout the entire painting, but not as much as right there. Right, yeah. That's true. Wow. Beautiful. And that's because there's darker tones around 
the bright yellows. Mm -hmm. And it's only place he's used that yellow one here. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, I just want to go through a few before four. we end, you know. Wow. And I'm going to go a little over because we had some snafus. So um, I'm not going to give the title to this one. And I want to see what mood is this? What, where are, where's he going in his imagination with this one? To a carnival, to a fair. <laughs> That's great. With a, with a hot air balloon or something or a balloon. Yeah, it looks like a balloon. It is called red balloon. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> you sense, you sense uh, uh, some freedom looking at the balloon. Why do you think it's a freedom? What is it that causes the, that? The, the, uh, because it's round and the rest are not round. They have sharp edges. Oh, really. it's different from everything yeah, else. Right. Yes. Is, I is think there, also, there's another thing that I see that causes that freedom, which is it's got space all around it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's up high. So it's almost yeah. like, you know, away from everything. Right. Is this oil? This it's oil. And it's also chalk. Oh, I see. Mm. And it was made in 1922. Yeah. I can almost so, call it State Fair. Yeah. Yeah, I love the colors in this. I love, again, the luminosity, meaning the brighter yellows with the deeper tones, but deeper tones around it to bring out the bright. But there's another thing going on in this piece that I really love, and it's the combination of the complementary colors right. red and green right and they really make each other pop the purple that's a very important aspect yeah. of the color the purple mm -hmm. and the purple and, and the yellow it's also the purple and yellow yes mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see why he put that black square there <laughs> We can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm distracted by it. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Actually, I think it, it makes other things stand out because of the contrast of dark mm -hmm. and light. Uh -huh. and in it's a way, it's balanced that by that brown square and also mm -hmm. by the dark blue sort of edging that's to the up and to the left of the. You so follow it's kind of balanced the, out the by black, dark. Right? Yeah. So you follow the black to this blue and then to this blue. Yeah, and also See? that brown square is uh, and here kind of balancing well. yes. it, yeah. Yes. It gives it a depth. It feels like it gives it a depth, looking at the black and then the blue to the blue. There's more depth, you know, to the painting. Yeah. And you know, maybe for the person who said that it was too much, maybe that person would prefer to see black somewhere else as well. Like, you know, because we all have a different <laughs> sense of what feels right. It's interesting that way. You know, I feel it's a fair, very balanced piece, but mm -hmm. I can also see that the black is really separate as well. Mm -hmm. Well, there is some black in the left corner that's yeah. on the bottom, and yeah. that kind of kind of anchors it a little. Mm -hmm. That helps. I, I, I see the I see the black square as kind of like a chimney in the distance in the shadow. <laughs> yeah, the I love the little pillars there. Right stand out to me are just that he's created this sense of depth with these diagonal lines but and it's actually also there's like a battle between the flatness and the depth because you have all these squares that are head on and then you have those the red and blue triangle which are kind of mediating like they're they're kind of like diagonal but they're also on the flat plane mm -hmm. so that that I really right like that sort of battle between through two and three dimensions, <laughs> but and I also just love the texture that he creates that where he can take this flat area but create this luminosity that gives it incredible depth and completely really beautiful. You can really see the influence of Franz Mark in this piece. Mm. Franz Franz Mark used these really. Uh, big color blocks. I have two mm -hmm. of Franz Marx prints, in, not ob not obviously real ones, but you know <laughs> they, they they come from Germany and they're in my living room. And Franz Marx does this. He'll he'll have a beautiful painting of of horses, and then he'll have a big white color block, or he'll he'll have a, an orange block. And uh -huh. it, it has something to do with focusing the attention. When I look at the painting of these, I, I think they're called the blue horse, red horse. Is uh huh. 
Have you seen that painting with Frank? I know his horse paintings and they're yeah. amazing. Yeah, but he, he does these really large geometric shapes that almost make it feel like the horse is like, you know, coming off of the edge of the world. Beautiful. Beautiful. I think that's going on here too. I, I, I think you're right in terms of the bright color. I'm going to move on to the next one here. Oh. Oh. Uh, this one is called Fire in the Evening. Oh. And it That's is um, an oil as well, made in 1929. And I, I feel this has a lot of excitement, but it also has rest, restful qualities. The horizontal lines. Yeah, where, mm -hmm. where, do you, where do you all go with that? Well, horizontal lines are usually restful. Definitely. Mm -hmm. This evokes music for me. It feels very musical. In what know. way, Sarah? Huh? In what way? Um, in the, that it has rhythm, sort of like a background rhythm, and then... Um, it has some like faster stuff going on in the foreground. So it almost feels like there's a kind of like a rhythmic mm -hmm. continuo or, or something and, and harmony. And then you have sort of more melodious things that still fit into the whole, the rhythm of the whole, but they also are, you know, making a statement kind of in the foreground. So yeah, it feels like. I, I like that analogy because in music we have these subtle variations sometimes from one chord to another, you know, that are near each other. We also have faster to slower. Like there's a sense of movement of big blocks to getting smaller gradually. You know, there's there's a lot of gradual, beautiful gra gradation and shift in here that that I love that analogy of music. Does anybody see anything related to fire in this? Well, yes. Absolutely. Um, those two squares. That are, are it's in earth it. in the foreground, it's fire in the middle, and it's sky above. Oh, yeah. I, I so, see sea in the background. Do you see the sea on the top? Uh, the, yeah. That orange is so vivid. Mm -hmm. It feels like this is a kind of pixelation. You know, it's an artistic pixelation. He's yeah. reduced, he's created a world of just rectangles and squares, or just one square, really, uh, almost square. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like he's seeing, he's seeing this sunset through a prism that mm. translates to these, these sections. Beautifully said. It, it, it could feel like that, especially because there's one big square, or, you know, small square, but bright, that's that's orange, really bright, but it's affecting the landscape in a sense. If that's how you're seeing it, mm -hmm. you know, with with the red other other places. Well, you can see you can see kind of that the, if you if you will, the sun is coming through in that lower orange bar on the lower left. It's like it's shining there and it's shining up above it a little bit. It, it, there's such a beautiful rhythm and symmetry to that. It's very calming, lovely. Yeah. I love the use of color in that he used a lot of analogous colors that, you know, were colors that were close together on the color wheel with the blues and the purples. And they're, and they're a, a wonderful contrast complement to those, that orange, which really pops. And I think because the other colors are more subdued, yeah. that, that orange just comes forward and it feels like fire or light coming in. Yeah. And you know that orange or red orange is the warmest color on the color mm. wheel? No, yeah. Red yeah. orange is the hottest color. Mm. Now it's not necessarily the brightest, but it's the hottest. Yeah. <laughs> So this one right here is red orange, right? But this is this is bright. <laughs> this is almost a red orange, but more toward an orange. So I wonder if he's also playing with simultaneous contrast here. Mm -hmm. Because that gray, for example, that very large bar, and then the one over far to the left. Uh -huh. I'm almost I'm almost believing that those two are the same color, but he's saying something about simultaneous contrast because that orange 
sitting next to that gray makes that gray look lighter than the gray that's on the far left. Well, yeah, that's interesting. You know, simultaneous contrast, for those of you who are not aware of what that is exactly, I like, I like the thought about that, Elise, is basically you can have one color in two different places. Mm -hmm. So simultaneously, at the same time, you've got this other color around it that's mm -hmm. different on each section, mm -hmm. and it makes the color look different. Mm -hmm. The one on the right looks brighter, I mean lighter, mm -hmm. And the one on the left looks to me darker, actually. Yeah, yeah. it does. And, and that's because of what's surrounding it. Yeah, exactly. And that's the simultaneously around it. At the same time, it's creating this different image. <laughs> I hey. think he, he was aware of it. I bet he was. Hey, Julie, hey, hey Julie I'm noticing when you're moving your cursor, there's a, um, there's a quality of darkening the I'm lower part. I'm trying to get rid of it. And I, <laughs> this is yeah. all new to me. That's okay. That's okay. No, I'm just observing that it's, it's very interesting because because there's moments when you're when you've moved out of the out of, out of off it, and then this then the big bright bar oh. at the bottom <laughs> jumps out. Then it looks even brighter. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like then I oh then it's suddenly yeah. suddenly a, a fire across the ground almost, and then 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 reflections of the fire above or something. You're right. It's, it changes it changes it a bit. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> just observing. Oh, I love oh, this, this one is called um, Ad Parnassus, Parnassum, which is Latin for taking little steps of learning at a time. Oh, and and uh, Julia, what medium is this? Uh, this is oil? in oil. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And it was made in 1932, and it was considered pointillism. Yeah, I was going to say, just like <laughs> pointillism. Yeah. What's yeah. this? Like is it on paper? On plain paper? I believe it's probably on cardboard. Okay. Um, so, I mean, not cardboard, but some kind of a board. I think it's influencing also by the mosaics that he saw when he was on his travels. Yes. Well, you got that right, because this he did when, when either when he was in Egypt or yes. when he came back from Egypt. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, the pyramid. I see the, yeah. the, uh -huh. the pyramid. Also, it looks a little bit like a temple to me. It it has a, a glowing quality. Maybe that's because I'm seeing it on a computer screen and the light's coming through it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was seeing the actual artwork. It would be as glowing, but it has a quality of uh, being some very special structure, you know, that's sacred or something like that. It feels that to me. And it also has a lot of iridescence. Yeah. Mm. Like, do you notice how the little areas have lots of color all near each other that yeah. sparkle a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like fabric. There's so much. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of texture. texture. There's yeah. a lot of texture in this picture. What, what is the purpose of him uh, putting this V on the bottom? I have no idea. Yeah. I don't. Well, to connect the, the um, archway at the bottom to the uh, top part with this one huh? well you know i'll say one thing that v on the bottom mm -hmm. in a way the point of it is pointing upward right yeah so yeah. maybe it's just maybe some kind of a sign of moving up but it might mean something to him but it's almost pointing to the sun mm -hmm. julie be. did you say this was called gratis um can you oh, say this is called ad parnassum Ad pronounce So you know what? I just looked up the phrase because I it made it, you mentioned music and there's a piece of music by Debussy that's gratis ad parnassus parnassum. So I just looked up the phrase. Oh, gratis ad parnassum means steps to parnassus. It is sometimes shortened to. It has also been used to refer to various books or instruction or guides in which gradual pro progress in literature, language instruction, music, or the arts in general is sought. So I, I I'm just so. It's a very interesting phrase that's been used. Thank you. Yes. I, I, I think what I did is I saw that same definition and I simplified it. So it's great to see it both ways. Yeah. I, I see this as, um, for one thing, extremely calming. And one of the reasons I find it so calming is that he's established a foundation. I mean, if this is ad parnassum to, you know, to... Uh, support uh, his artistic endeavor each stone has been carefully put in place 
to establish the foundation for this remarkable thing that he's created. So it's just very, very calming and extraordinarily beautiful. Yeah. How did he draw all those small squares? Unbelievable. You know, this is another thing I'd love to ask him. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just looked up uh, Ad Parnassum on Wikipedia and it, it describes the piece. I can read oh. a little bit. It says it, it was created while Klee was teaching at the Dusseldorf Academy following his trip to Egypt three years prior. The painting process mm -hmm. consisted of first applying large squares of muted color on an unprimed canvas. Klee then stamped on smaller squares, first in, right and, uh -huh. in white and then in other diluted colors. Um, the composition is dominated by the shape of a pyramid outlined with stamped lines. I love the fact that he stamped them on. I wonder how he was able to stamp with such a tiny little, I know, you know, yeah. Yeah. tiny little shape. Yeah. Or, or he had a stamp that had maybe uh, one of those squares on it, or he had three or four different sizes, and he put color on them and stamped it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. probably what he did. It's, so, it's do you see amazing. any connection between the triangle? over the sun and the triangle down, the V down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And a whole bunch of triangles actually. Yeah. 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 Well, he's using triangles and rectangles or squares, right? Con right. The only right. difference in shape here, the one that's all by itself again, well, is it's what- the, the circle. The <laughs> circle. <laughs> he likes it's making fun. the circle separate. There's mm -hmm. something about the circle for him. I'd love to know that and maybe, if, if you are on the Facebook group and you find that out, share it, please. What was the circle to Paul Clay? <laughs> you know, uh, what well, I, you know I, Jung, really? Yeah. Jung said that the circle was the symbol of individuation or the individual. So it could be him inserting himself into the piece. Jung said that? Yeah. Ah. Ah. Individuation. The individuation process is symbolized by the circle. Yeah. Well, this is so fun to look at. We're going to go to the can next I, one. Can I just say, I, it's hard for me to get in sometimes, but what I find so curious is how he uses this very elongated triangle to create depth. If if I look at this, I, it's almost like he's made this whole structure oh, three dimensional by the way he's using that line of that triangle and also using the, the light values. It, do, you, do you see it, Julie? That it I see that long triangle right here, right? Do you, and do you see how it looks like it's going inside the pyramid? Yeah. I, I do see that there's a lot of translucency. I actually see that it looks, I mean, it's like an architectural skill, you know, when you do like a box ah. and you make these lines, you know, and some of them are like you would do a dot 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 it's in the background you know what i'm talking about when you make a box and you go like this and yes i do uh -huh. lines. that's what i see he's doing here he's made that line on the bottom for example he's making it look like it's going back that's how i see it okay very interesting it's an important line otherwise it would just be you know kind of boring and he points it to that yellow uh square mm -hmm. Well, you know, do you realize also that the, the triangle that's facing this way on top yep. is getting its opposite direction down here? Yeah. And that's creating some balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we have one more painting mm. here. And this one is called Park by Lu. And B-E-I in German means near. So it's a park near Lou, which is a city in Switzerland. Mm. So, so um, I just think this has a delightful, very playful quality to it. And I am wondering how this piece brings in your, brings out your imagination for seeing interesting things. What, what, or was he on purpose wanting you to, do you think, or do you see something that you just would, you know, come up with on your own? Maybe he didn't think of it at all. Well, I just know it just make, it gives me a joyful feeling. I, I big smile on my face. <laughs> Very delightful. That's I great. think part of that is that the majority of the lines are curved or go are moving upward. 
So you don't have, it's not necessarily calm except for the colors. The pastels can be calming, yes. but, um, but the line, the, his, he has such wonderful use of line. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're so graceful and it just looks like lots of trees and maybe a pathway to, you know, different parts of a forest or <laughs> uh, it's uh yeah, it's very playful. Totally. Dancing. Yeah, it's yeah. athletic. Yes, dancing, <laughs> dancing tree. Rhythmic again, right? Mm -hmm. He's yeah. a musician also. He was a musician also. So there it is. There's a lot of rhythm. It's yummy. Yummy. It's yummy. Those colors are yummy. That's for sure. I know it's they nice. look like yeah. ice cream and various yeah. things like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, is that yeah, also right. oil pink, Julie? Uh, this one here is an oil. It's 28 by 40 inches. Wow. So it's a Beautiful. bigger piece. Wow. wow. And, and what I believe year is it, it is in Switzerland. What so year is it, Julie? Uh, 1938. Mm -hmm. When did he die? 1940. Mm -hmm. I see that this is correlated with the end of his life. Right. Wow. Oh. So, um, Looks so one last one or two comments on this, and then I'm going to move on just a little more. So Elise, I want to know why you feel that that way. I, I'm just curious. he's saying something about that circle. He's filling it. Oh, that oh. yellow, that orange circle. It feels to mm -hmm. me like he's saying something, kind of culminating his life. Ah. Yeah, yeah. With with a tree in the middle of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, tree of life. Tree of life. life. Yeah. Tree of life. But it is a dance. There's so much movement throughout all the lines lovely yeah the tree in the middle is bearing fruit yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. good that's a good point yeah but it's There's... still that warm circle right that individuality but now it's filled yes and, and oh. do you notice do you notice how this orange mm -hmm. is different from everything else again that's mm -hmm. all the other oranges that yeah. circle yeah. the theme yeah. that we keep seeing in clay's work yeah of something different that's a little warmer in tone and yeah. brighter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I everybody... a lot of faces also because uh, like those two circles that are below and to the right of the tree are, they look like two eyes and, and nose, you know, and then That's on the left good. side at that level. Oh, right here. Right. Yeah, there. And then on the left side, there are like two closed eyes yeah oh yeah uh, yeah and then those other circles to me at, at least some of them look like like in the lower right there's a sort of like a figure where that circle is like the head there yeah and or it could be a ball in space on a chair <laughs> yeah you know that too yeah I have oh what about that other circle on the top left um, that looks a little bit like the eye of some kind of an animal could be a wolf right here, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. yeah, right. with a really long beak, yeah, so you know, some kind yeah. of an animal, it could be a fox or a or a coyote or something like that. Well, that's funny, I see that as a dancer, me yeah, too, oh, me too. Oh, I'm on point, oh, a dancer, yeah, I'm on point with the dancer. Arms. <laughs> Yeah. And one leg going backwards. It looks like he's like he's she's it's she he standing on an arm and the two legs are up and one is out and mm -hmm. yeah it's like a yeah. perfect balancing act. I love it. It's like That's Alex Calder, you know. Yeah. And then he also has some letters. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. The F like and the F Y and F the and T y. sort of. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is this a painting and not wallpaper? <laughs> it would be very busy to have that in the house, I think. No, no, no. What I'm asking is, why is this fine art? Oh. Well. Because a wallpaper you have, what, compared? What's different? Well, well there's a, not yeah, repeating the shapes. This is a complete composition, you know, within this rectangle. It's not something that really should be repeated. It's sort of like a little world in itself. Right, but even though the colors are all repeated, mm -hmm. there are enough changes in it. Yeah. And there's a center of interest. And that's what separates fine art from a wallpaper. 
And it leaves <laughs> questions. It leaves questions, I think. It leaves questions, exactly. Well, everybody, thank you so much for being part of this discussion tonight. Um, I just want to end this with a few interesting tidbits that I think you'll enjoy. One is that Paul Clay wrote some wonderful notebooks. And for those of you who are really interested in learning about design in a lot of ways, I would write this down or come back and look at the video again on the Facebook group when it's up. But it's called, um, one of them was called, uh, let me get the, uh, the Thinking Eye, and the other, The Nature of Nature. They're both on Amazon, and I think there's something like $35 or something. But it sounds like some people have lauded these books and these writings you know, on, on the level of Leonardo da Vinci's writings about realistic art. Mm -hmm. and, and Clay's writings are about abstract. So I just thought that was interesting. And, and if you don't buy them all before I do, I will get them too. <laughs> uh, Wait, Julie, can you say those names again? Yes, um, The Thinking Eye and The Nature of Nature. And these are writings of Paul Clay? It's too? his writings and his notebook. And in fact, uh -huh. it probably has drawing in there too, but I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, and then I'm going to end with, um, with a quote and a, and a, a couple quotes. Um, painting, this is his quote, painting is not about painting what is visible. It is about painting what is invisible. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you a really wonderful imaginative doll that I got when I was in Texas. <laughs> Very cool. Wow. Oh. Oh, that is nice. Ah, yeah. Very nice. <laughs> and it said, imagination is the highest kite you can fly. Wow. Ooh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Isn't that great? All the gems. Yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. So um, I invite all of you, I'm going to remove the spotlight. So, well, actually, I want to view all of you now. Uh, I invite all of you to join the um, Facebook group, Abstract Art Behind the Scenes. Uh, and what I'm going to do is tonight and then every other day, I will be putting up another painting with a question. And the painting will be a Paul Clay painting this week. So, um, so first of all, I'd love for you to join that group, uh, Abstract Art Behind the Scenes. And, um, and then also, I'm going to play just the very end of this whole video, um, a little song that I wrote, the end of a song that I wrote, Colors of the Heart. And with that is an explanation of my new business called Sustaining Arts which is all about connecting sustainability and art to bring more beauty into our lives and on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I really would love you to know about Sustaining Arts and the websites on there. And I look forward to seeing you again. This has been really fun. And yes. I'm really considering doing this for a full hour now. <laughs> I think it works better. Thank you, Julie. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Because I can see you, you really Julie. get into this. So I'm going to put that on for you now and say goodbye, but you can watch this as, I, as we're going, okay? Thank, Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Thank Bye. you. The art of dreams. Dreams of art. A closer world, a world apart. The color wheel of changing hue.